Welcome to Lecture 22 of Biology 115 entitled Phylogenetics. In our previous lectures, we've looked at some hardcore evolutionary mechanisms and ideas all based off of different evolutionary concepts such as Darwinian evolution, microevolution, and macroevolution most recently. We're going to now shift gears and start looking at a different sort of idea on the evolutionary side of biology and look at more of a classification story and the idea of understanding how organisms are classified the way that they are. And in order to understand this, we're going to start with a basic introductory flowchart and entitle this first flowchart, Introduction. So, to begin, phylogenetics is a branch of a study that falls under a broader study that we can call systematics. So there's a broad study of biology called systematics. And in systematics, we do the following. So we're going to define it right underneath. In systematics, we study the diversity of organisms. So study diversity of organisms. So ORGS for organisms. But specifically, this diversity is going to be coupled with something very important. We also study, and we'll say, and their, not only their diversity, but and their, what we would call evolutionary, so EVO for evolutionary relationships. That's a key here when we're studying phylogenetics and when we're studying systematics as a whole. So we're going to be focusing a lot on these evolutionary relationships for a lot of this lecture, but we're going to initially look at the idea of diversity and how we classify diversity in the scope of phylogenetics. Systematics itself can be broken down into two separate studies that combine together to give us this complete overall study known as systematics. The first type of systematics that you can understand is taxonomy. And taxonomy is usually always coupled with the idea of also studying what we call phylogeny. Each of these encompass the entire definition that we stated here, and we're going to break this down. Taxonomy is simply the idea of describing, it also involves with the descriptions, naming, describing, naming, and thus also classifying. These three things are what describe taxonomy in a nutshell. It's the study of describing, naming, and classifying different organisms. So what have we covered in our systematics definition? Study the diversity of organisms, and that's clearly devoted to taxonomy. But another way to study the diversity of organisms besides just describing, naming, and classifying is to study their evolutionary relationships. And that's what phylogeny is all about. This study is going to be devoted to looking at evolutionary history of organisms. And it's a very powerful, powerful study, especially based off of the modern techniques that we have that, that allow us to study ge whole genomes per se, uh, for example. So that's our idea of systematics. Moving forward from this, we're going to start looking at different taxonomy studies and sub-studies of this entire field. Namely, we're going to continue our introduction by understanding something we've mentioned before, but just reiterating and really uh, driving home a point in the fact that we use something called binomial nomenclature in uh, any sort of taxonomic systematic study. And binomial nomenclature, as you probably already know, was a system developed by Mr. Carlos Linnaeus, so we'll uh, give him credit where credit is due, of course. And this is Linnaeus' system, and it's a genius system in which you're going to name a species, binomial nomenclature, so this is, this is the name, but binomial means two names, and that's what, exactly what we're going to do. We're going to name species with um, a unique two-part name, with a unique two-part name. And that's very clear from the title itself. And Linnaeus is what, who came up with this. And we know that the two-part name is genus and species. So we're going to write down genus. But instead of writing species, we're actually going to be a little bit more technical in this lecture. And we're going to say that it's genus. And it's also going to be the second part of the name will include what we call the specific epithet. This is just a more technical term. Uh, especially when we're talking about phylogenetics and taxonomy and systematics as a whole. And it's a better term to use for this lecture than just the general term of species because species, um, it gives us, a, it kind of confuses uh, the idea of whether or not we're looking at biological species concept, morphological species concept, etc. So we're just going to call the two-part name genus and specific epithet. This is just a different, more specific way of understanding this. Um, classic example, an example that we've already gone over, of course, is um, the example of 
of humans. Humans are classified as Homo, that's our genus, and our specific epithet is sapiens, Homo sapiens. And this actually uh, roughly translates from Latin into the wise man. So very nice binomial nomenclature style name for humans. That's all by Linnaeus. In addition, when we're studying binomial nomenclature, we have to be aware that the species level in binomial nomenclature and a lot of systematics as a whole is going to be our basic unit of study. Just like the cell is the basic unit of life or the basic unit of your body, if there's a study devoted to the study of diversity of organisms and evolutionary relationships, there's got to be a basic unit that we can work this study off of and build things, build relationships, build uh, these evolutionary relationships and classify life altogether. And that basic unit is a species. The species is a good basic unit to start developing further and further and further more advanced evolutionary relationships, for example. Lastly, in binomial nomenclature, there are a couple of rules that you need to understand and remember. Exams always ask about a couple of these rules just to make sure that you're paying attention. The rules are quite simple and you've probably seen them, you just didn't know that they were actually rules in the binomial nomenclature system. First and foremost, binomial nomenclature, the classification of names, let's say, is always written in Latin. In addition to this Latin terminology, this Latin language use, we also are going to make sure that we uh, specifically, this is how uh, in-depth we get with these rules, we have to make sure that the genus is capitalized. So notice how I capitalized the G. And when we're writing a genus, we always follow it with a specific epithet. And that specific epithet, and I'm just going to write this as a lowercase s in cursive just to emphasize that it's lowercase. This is going to be genus and then specific epithet. And notice this is lowercase and this is uppercase. That's a, that is a rule that you need to follow whenever you're utilizing binomial nomenclature. In addition to this very specific rule, we also have to make sure that uh, this is just a, sort of a formality of this study, is that the, the name is written in italics, actually. Um, you will always see, especially when you look at a paper, a uh, biological paper, and even in your textbook, whenever you see a genus and a species specific epithet, you will see it written in italics. If you're handwriting, the common convention is to simply underline the entire thing. So maybe I could just do that right over here, underline Homo sapiens, because that's what represents italics. You can't really show italics in handwriting. You just underline it to show that you know that italics uh, are part of the binomial nomenclature rule. Moving forward, number four, is that the genus itself can be abbreviated. So genus can be abbreviated. And a basic idea behind this is that if you have, let's say, something like Homo sapiens right over here, I don't have to write Homo sapiens. I can write H capital with a dot right next to it and then sapiens. And we've seen this before as well. We can do something like maybe uh, E, capital E, because it's genus, capital, and then we can write coli. Basic idea right there for rule number four. Rule number five we'll do over here since we're running out of space. Rule number five is that the genus is uh, always going to be really unique. Okay, genus is unique. And what I mean by this is that if you look at the genus, the genus is something that can be used on its own. In a sense, you can say something like, um, I'm studying the genus, let's say, um, Escheicheria, which is the E. coli genus. Let me make sure I capitalize that. It's spelled E-S-C-H-E-R-C-H-I. You can say this without being looked down upon in the binomial nomenclature world. You can say that, that I'm studying the genus Escheria, and that's what I, I'm looking at. But this, the converse of this is the fact that the specific epithet is not always unique. So I'm going to write SE for specific epithet is not always unique. Meaning that you cannot simply say the specific epithet and expect somebody to know what you're referring to. When you say the genus Escheria, they automatically know what you're referring to, but when you say something like the specific epithet coli, it doesn't really make sense. It's just not a good way of understanding binomial nomenclature. It's a convention and a naming rule that we have to understand. So those are the six basic rules. Put these to memory. They're important. You're going to be seeing them over and over again as we study classification. Speaking of classification, we'll complete this video by looking at the idea of what we call hierarchical classification. This is something, again, we've covered before, but we want to reiterate because we want this as a working knowledge to build off of. What we have to remember one more time, I'm going to reiterate, is that in the hierarchical classification world, the species, of course, is going to be our basic level. Okay, This is our basic level of classification. 
meaning that we're going to work off of the species and start building more hierarchies based off of the basic level that is the species. What I mean by this is that we establish a hierarchy in the animal and living world, let's say. And this hierarchy is exactly what you would expect it to be. It's something you've seen for a very long time. It goes domain, kingdom, phylum, I'm just abbreviating it. Uh, domain, kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So we have these uh, hierarchical classification systems that get more and more exclusive or more and more inclusive depending on which way you go. We're going to talk about that in just a second. And let's say I randomly pick uh, this one right here. If you randomly pick any one of these classification hierarchies, you have chosen what we call a taxon. This is a taxon. So is phylum, so is class, so, so is order. But I just chose K for purposes of example. And a taxon, you can define it as um, a group at any one of these levels. So a group at any one level. Just like kingdom is a group at the kingdom level and specific epithet is a group at the specific epithet level. So that's what a taxon is. There are all these taxons. Um, just uh, another naming convention to understand. Finally, the last thing that we want to go over in this video is the idea of inclusivity and exclusivity. What I'm going to state is that each taxonomic level Okay, so each taxon, notice, taxonomy, taxon, it all makes sense, right? Describing, naming, classifying. Each taxonomic uh, level is more inclusive. So I'm going to make this very clear. Is more, and this always gets confusing for students, but it's very, very easy to remember. Is more inclusive, okay? Each taxonomic level is more inclusive than the one below it. Okay, so I'm going to say below it in quotes because it's a, it's a weird term to think of. Basic idea behind this is to look at an example and it's really going to drive home a point. If I look at the example of a, animals that we are all familiar with, like a cat, I can start utilizing this inclusivity concept in the sense that if I have, uh, if I look at the family that the cat belongs to, the family is equal to what we call Philidae. And Philidae are a specific family devoted to its own taxon because Philidae present themselves with a, a very characteristic short face. And I don't have much room here, but you can also write down modified teeth, highly modified specific teeth. So that's our family. What's right above the family level? Right above the family level right here is our O. So that's order. And it belongs to the order um, Carnivora. And we all know what carnivores are, and this is exactly what we're talking about. Carnivora have teeth um, for meat. They have specific teeth for meat. The family gets even more specific in the sense that the teeth are even more modified and more unique for the Philidae family. In Carnivora, the teeth are specifically for meat, and thus they are meat eaters. So, so far we have Philidae, Carnivora, and now we're going to go above one more level to class. And its class, the cat's class at least, is uh, Mammalia. And we all know what mammals are, and Mammalia are those that usually have fur and the idea that they produce milk. What have we done here? What we've done is we've gotten more and more inclusive as we've gone up this ladder. As we've gone up this ladder from family, we only had f people that have short faces and very highly modified teeth. But then we went higher and we got more inclusive. We included more organisms when we got to the order Carnivora. Because now we include not just, let's say, Philidae, but we also in include like um, not just the short-faced modified teeth individuals, but things like canines, those individuals that are like dogs. Now dogs are, have teeth for meat as well, so do Philidae. And then we got all the way up to class. We got even more or included animals in the class mammalia. This could be us, this could be dogs, this could be cats, this could be uh, anything that's a mammal. So we get more and more inclusive as we, let's say, move up. And each taxonomic level is more inclusive than the one below it. So what we mean by this is that domain includes more than kingdom. Kingdom includes more than phylum. Phylum includes more than class. Class includes more than order, just like we did here. So mammalia includes more than carnivore. Carnivore includes more than philidae in terms of how many organisms are within this hierarchical classification. Be able to understand that if you go the opposite way, you get more and more exclusive. You get more and more exclusive. Be, under, be able to differentiate inclusivity versus exclusivity. And that concludes our introduction.